we're dealing with this journey from uh, slavery to Canaan. And so as we kind of walk through this, our theme for the year is entering the season of more than enough. And there's just a process we need to walk through to get there. So today, um, we're out of Egypt. Um, we have crossed the Red Sea. We're in the wilderness of Canaan. And um, there's some things, there's instructions that God needs to give in the wilderness that I want us to kind of talk through um, briefly this morning. So I'm just going to lay some foundation. How far we get is how far we get that God would have his way. So if you can put the next slide on the screen, um, I want, I want to, to talk through this. I'm kind of calling it a big idea, but because it's lengthy, I have a preaching idea that's more succinct. Now, I need you to get this in your spirit if you don't get nothing else in your spirit. If this is all you lock into or read, I want you all to get that in your spirit, okay? So let me, let me read it. It says, whenever we worship anything as the vehicle through which we receive our blessings from God, then we credit the thing with the move of God in our lives. We tempt God to abandon his plans for our lives and creating the need for mediation between God and ourselves. I don't care what y'all think. I think that's deep. You know, um, that's, that's heavy. Um, as I was kind of summarizing the text, that summarizes what I'm going to talk about. Whenever we worship anything as the vehicle through which we receive our blessings from God we, and credit the thing with the move of God in our lives, we tempt God to abandon his plans for us, creating the need for mediation between God and in our cells. That has me jacked up because I'm guilty. Yeah, you get what I'm saying? I'm, I'm guilty. Um, if you know me, I like a certain type of car that's not a Mercedes. And, um, <coughs> and a lot of time, I credit the thing for the move of God. That's crazy. That's crazy. And here's what I'll say. God has blessed me. We'll talk through that. Put the preaching idea on the screen. Let me just hit this, the next one real quick. So here's how I summarize. Worship God for who he is, not because of what he does. Yeah. 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 You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you remember that out of the series, it'll help us. Um, as we move through the wilderness of our lives to get to the Canaan that God has in store for us. We worship God for who he is, not because of what he does. Now, let me tell you the importance of this statement. This statement is, is so important that if we can get to worshiping God for who he is, we'll never expect him or get mad with him when he does not do. You get what I'm saying? Um, that's a very, very important statement as we kind of walk through the text today. Because um, let me pray and then I'll, I'll read my introduction. Then I need to give you some literary context, which might, I'm going to try to abstract up as fast as I can to get to the text. Let's pray. Let's pray that we're going to talk through this. Holy Spirit, have your way, God, speak through me. I die, I move myself out of the way. As you've been dealing with this journey from the slavery places of our lives, those entrapment, those places that has us in bondage to get us to where we can enjoy the blessings you have in store for us. But it calls for a shift in mindset. So as I share this morning, open the hearts of every person here, just like you are opening my heart to learn more and to be receptive and to hear and to be in tune with you. So be the teacher this morning, God, so we can receive from you. So bless and have your way. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Now, I'm going to begin in Exodus chapter 19. But before you go there, I need you to listen to me just for uh, a minute or two as I kind of share this by way of um, introduction. My problem and your problem, and the problem with believers in Christ is we have a problem waiting on God. Right? We want it fixed, and we want it fixed now. When we pray, we want God to answer now. 
We want God to move on our behalf. We want God to just, um, if I pray today, if I give God a week, <laughs> I'm cool, you know. But, but to give him any length of time, I start doubting God as it relates to whether he cares for me or not. So my sin more times than often happens not so much in the prayer, it's in the wait. It's in those silent moments when I've petitioned God and when it is as if God is not speaking to me anymore and I can't hear the voice of God, then I become um, complacent, I become restless, I struggle, I go through counseling, I go through a whole lot of stuff because I feel as if God has abandoned me and I have a difficult time waiting. You guys get what I'm saying? So, 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 while I am waiting, if God does not respond on my timetable, I will build a golden calf. while I'm waiting, just so I could know God is still with me. Really, 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 this, this text is, is messing with me. That's why I really thought I'd be done today, but I just really need to kind of talk about this carefully. Um, I'm venturing to say, I think I'm comfortable in saying the majority of us in here, I don't care how deep you are, how long you've been saved, at some point in your journey, in the way, you too have built a golden calf and then had the nerve to ask God to come bless your cow. I'm your pastor, and I've done it. <laughs> and, and I know a lot of us have done it. We just don't know that we've done it. And so this is why I'm saying our, 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 our challenge is to worship God for who he is, not for what he can do or what he does. You get what I'm saying? Because um, in, in the doing, we're praying for certain things, and then we'll erect these images and stuff and cause God and ask God to, to bless it. And so we want to tell God what to do, but we don't want him to tell us what to do. You get what I'm saying? Turn to your neighbor real quick, turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, neighbor. wait on him. Neighbor. The other neighbor, say, other neighbor, other neighbor. say, wait on him. Neighbor. Now, let me give you literary context really quick. So go to Exodus chapter 19. Um, we just finished 17. And so I need to walk you through a couple of things to set up what I'm going to talk about, and I'm just going to share one point. I'm not going to make it this morning. I can tell you that right now. Um, chapter 17, we saw last, we dealt with that two weeks ago, uh, with the battle of the defeat of the Amalekites, where I kind of told you, get some help. We kind of deal with that. In chapter 18, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, comes and he gives Moses some leadership advice, um, which is very, very important. I wrestle with whether to talk about it or not. Um, there are so many principles there I can extract. I am doing my doctoral thesis on chapter 18, so buy the book when it comes out. Um, <laughs> chapter 19 now, in chapter 19, um, the Israelites are in this place where God have brought them out of Egypt, and he delivered them in the Red Sea, and now he's beginning the process of saying to them, hey, wait, let me tell you all what to do next. Okay, now here's what you need to know. Up until that point in time, there were no laws per se where God had not yet given them specific instructions on what they need to do next. He simply delivered them from slavery and now he has them in this pattern where he's about to give them specific instruction for when they go into the land of Canaan. And, and I like that parallel because it reminds me of, of the discipleship process. God delivers you and I from the mess that we find ourselves in. Are you with me? And then he tells us, go sit down, let me disciple you. 
But some of us are so impatient, we don't want to be disciples. We want to tell God, use me, I'm ready to go. And that's where we mess up the most. You kind of get what I'm saying? So chapter 19 now, God begins the process. Let me read a couple of verses, then I'll, I'll jump around to get to where we need to go. So if you look at verse 1, and I'm from the ES, reading in the ESV, 19 and 1. It says, on the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. So God has them at Sinai. They had set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. And it says there Israel um, encamped before the mountain. Verse 3, while Moses went up to God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel. Look at vor- verse 4. Very, very important verse. Come on, say verse 4. Verse four. Look at verse 4. You yourself have seen what who? I did, I did to who? <laughs> very, very, very important stuff that I'm emphasizing. How what? I, I bore you on eagle wings and brought you where? Okay, now, I I hate to belabor the point, but I need to make emphasis here, and I'm slowing myself down. Verse 4, God is telling the Israelites that I, God, brought you out of Egypt. You guys have seen that? And he says, the way I did it is I, God, bore you on eagle wings and brought you to who? Myself. And verses 5 through 7, let me abstract up. He's telling Moses um, what he wants the people to do, and he's still beginning to tell the people how he wants them to begin themselves. And look at verse 8. Verse 8 is important. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will what? Do, yeah. And so Moses goes back to God, and he reports the words of the Lord to the people. And verse 9, and the Lord said to Moses, hey, I'm coming down in a cloud. I'm kind of paraphrasing, and I'm going to speak to you. Um, And then Moses goes back to the people and tell them all this good stuff that they're going to do. And God says, I'm going to come down. There's a back and forth going on. And look at verse 16, okay? Now, here's what you need to see. Uh, I'm going to paint a picture in a little while. In verse 16, on the third day, after there were thunders and lightning, a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled, then Moses brought the people out of the camp to who? To do what? To meet God. That's deep. And they took their stand. Where? At the foot of the mountain. Look at verse 19 real quick. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke, and God answered him in the the thunder. Let me say this real quick. Let me give you a quick visual of what's happening. So God delivered the Israelites. Where do I want Egypt to be today? Let's put Egypt over here. He delivered the Israelites from Egypt, and he's taken them to Canaan. And now they're in this wilderness. They just left Rephidim, and they're at the bottom of Sinai. And God is on this mountain, and God comes down from the mountain with a great cloud. Are you with me? And he says to Moses, hey, Moses, I want to have a business meeting with all y'all. That's like breakfasts, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know I'm not going to let him live that down. Breakfasts, you know. <laughs> So, so he says, I want to have a meeting with all y'all. And, and so God comes down, and he's, he has this cloud around the mountain. And so from the cloud, he says to Moses, hey, Moses, come up here. And so Moses goes up, and God gives Moses specific instruction to call the people next to him. And he says, um, go tell the people certain things. Moses goes down, he tells them what God says. And they say to Moses, hey, go tell God we're going to do everything you say. This is deep. We're going to do everything you say. God says, okay. Moses says, hey, God, they're going to listen to you. Cool. Um, So bring them closer. Let me show them myself, and we're going to have a meeting together. That's chapter 19, right? And then, so chapter 20 happens, and you all know chapter 20. 20, like the back of your hand. We're going to come back to that um, in a little bit. I must come back to that so you almost bear some time with me. Go to chapter 24. Go to 24. Um, yeah. And I'm jumping ahead because a lot happened between chapter 20 and 24 where God has Moses and he's telling Moses certain things and Moses now is repeating to the people what God has said. So here's what you need to know. Between chapter 20 and 24, Moses has become the mouthpiece of God. You guys are with me? He's speaking to the people on behalf of God. And if you read that at a certain point, but let me see if it's 24. I don't know if it's in 24. Look at verse 12. 
Okay. The Lord said to Moses, come up to the mountain and wait here that I may give you tablets of stone which the law and the com- with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instruction. Verse 13, Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. Verse 14, and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Mary, Aaron um, and her are with you. When whoever has a dispute, let him go to him. I didn't read that well. You need to notice verse 14. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and her are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let them go to them. Verse 15. Then Moses went up to the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for how many days? Six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Look at 18. Moses entered the cloud and went up to the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain for how long? For how long? Okay, let me, let me, I need to narrate, narrate this really quick so I can get to chapter 32. And we can jump to 32. God is in the mountain, and there's this great cloud going on. And for a season, um, chapters 20 to 24, God is dialoguing with Moses, and he's releasing Moses really quick to go back to the people and say, thus saith the Lord. And as long as the people could see God or see the cloud, and they can see Moses, they were obedient to God. Right? Come on. As long as you all are in church, you're obedient to God. <laughs> right? The problem happens when we leave the presence of God. Come on, y'all. And so, so now here's what happens at the end. So chapter 24 is about to conclude, and here's what's happening. God is calling Moses now. I need you to stop being a messenger for a while. I need to take you in my presence. So Uh, I'm going to call you up here. So here's what Moses says to the Israelites. Hey, Israelites, God is calling me, so I'm going to take Joshua, and we're going to enter into the presence of God, the Holy of Holies, and we're going to be gone for a while. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to leave Aaron, and I'm going to leave her in charge. So if you have any problems or any disputes or anything, um, I'm going to be receiving the word of the Lord to tell you what God wants to do next. So if you have a challenge, go to Aaron and her, and they're going to settle it. And the last thing they saw of Moses was Moses going into this cloud, and he disappeared in the cloud as he went into the presence of God. You guys okay with me? Go to chapter 32. And there's a lot happening between 25 and 32 as well. Now, I'm going to try to do this in... A few minutes here, and then we'll pick it up next week. You there? Okay. Now, before I even put the next point on the screen, the next one, yeah. Um, Very similar to the preaching idea. God wants to be worshipped for who he what? Not because of what. What he can what? I kind of, the same thing, but I said it differently because I want it to resonate. Look at verse 1. And let me read verse 1 through 6, and then let me exegete it for you. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, okay? Now, remember with me, we just read that Moses was gone for a total now of about 40 days. Are you guys with me? Okay? The people gathered themselves together in Aaron to Aaron and said to him, Uh, Up, in other words, get up, make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and they brought them to Aaron. 
And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graven tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, most of you have seen the picture of this in many of pictures, many of movies. Um, we've seen images of the people being riotous at the base of Mount Sinai with this golden calf that they were worshiping. But I'm venturing to say the majority of us probably don't know what the problem with the golden calf was that really upset God so much. You get what I'm saying? And because we don't know what the problem with the golden calf was, you and I oftentimes make the mistake of building golden calves in the weight. And whenever we build a calf, we tempt God to abandon his original plan for us. And it presses us now to need mediation or repentance to get us back into a relationship with God. So as we take this journey from Canaan, I mean from Egypt to Canaan, I want to caution us as a people, as a church, as believers in Christ, um, not to make the mistake of worshiping God for what he can do, but to worship him for who he is. Are you getting me? Because if we worship him for what he can do, we'll always build a golden calf. And I'm going to explain that in a little while. I want us to walk through it. So come on, say amen if you're here with me. Now back up to verse 1. Here's what's happening. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from where? They called Aaron into a business meeting and they had a conversation. Now let me just say here real quick to you, it's not that like Moses was lost. They knew last time they saw Moses, he was entering the presence of God, and it wasn't even so much that they didn't know, not like they didn't know what Moses was doing in the presence of God. Matter of fact, verse 19 all the way to 24, God had given them illustrations on how he was going to speak to Moses and have Moses communicate to them his word. It just got to the place where God says, I'm about to write down what I'm saying now so they can have it as a memorabilia, so they can have it for the records. So if there's any questions, they can go read the record and they will see pointedly what I'm saying. So Moses, this is going to take a little time. So why don't you come up here? Are you with me? And hang out with me for a little while. This is free, but do you know when you're in the presence of God, it's hard to leave oh come on y'all you, you get what I'm saying and sometimes you just want to hang out there that's free that wasn't even part of the message but just sometimes it just gets good when you're there so you can't blame Moses for hanging out you know come on y'all and the problem not, wasn't so much with Moses, it was the people in the wait. And, and it's no different than me. My problem is not that God speaks or doesn't speak. My problem is I want him to talk when I want him to talk. Come on with me. And, and if you're like the majority of us in here and you've been in the struggle, I don't know what you're praying for. I don't know what the weight is. I don't know what you're going through. But it's like we become so impatient with God that if God doesn't speak when we want him to speak, we start trying to figure out what we need to do. And more times than often, we end up doing something as opposed to sitting down and giving God time to do what God said he's going to do. Do I have any witnesses in here? Come on, come on. Anybody in here other than myself that, that 40 days have come, and, and 40 days in Scripture is a metaphor for a long period of time that, that we expected it to happen this week, but we didn't get a call for the job this week, and it didn't happen next week, or we expected him or her to come home last week, but they didn't come home. Come on, y'all talk to me. And it's been 40 days and 40 nights. For some of us, it's been a year. It's been two years. And as opposed to God saying to you, I've got this, and you trusting him that he's got it, you start saying, well, you know what, God? 
God seem that you've responded, I need to do something about this. Come on. And you end up calling a meeting with the wrong, I wish I had somebody in here, with the wrong person in attempts to fix God and then got the nerve enough to tell God, I heard the word of the Lord through such and such. Stop the madness. Oh, come on, y'all talk to me this morning. Come on, talk to me this morning. God has your ear. He lowered himself in the cloud, and, and he, he, matter of fact, he positioned himself at the base of the mountain such that when he spoke, if you read the text, not only did Moses hear, but the people literally heard God for themselves. And we get to the place where we act as if we can't hear him no more. Because, like Grandma said, he may not come when we want him to. Talk to me, y'all. The problem is in the wait. The problem is in the wait. The problem is in the wait. Because it takes great maturity and it takes great patience, and it takes great commitment, listen to how I'm going to say it, to the last thing you heard God say. Henry Blackaby, you know, I might as well buy the book because you know I'm a Henry Blackaby fan, says it this way, when God seems silent, hang on to the last thing you heard God say. Katani and I do marital counseling a lot. And people come to us and they tell us their problem, problems, like breakfasts. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and we ask them how long you've been married. And they'd say like two years, five years. And I'm like, are you ready to quit? Um, because she'll tell you, it took us 16 years of waiting for the next word from God. Because the last thing we heard him say was we entered covenant. <laughs> Some of y'all missed that. <laughs> and he never came between that and say, break covenant. So I got to wait. And if you ever know anything about God speaking, he doesn't contradict himself. <laughs> but in the wait, because we become impatient, we call Aaron and set up a meeting because Aaron's in charge. <laughs> and, and we set up a meeting to tell Aaron, here's what I need you to do because God seems silent. Are you with me? And so I don't want us to mess up in going to Canaan this morning. So let me press ahead. Look at this, okay? So, so they gathered together. We're at verse 1. Uh, Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. The people gathered themselves together with Aaron and said to him, make us what? God. Come on, make us what? God. Gods. Who will do what? Go before us. Very, very important. I'm going to talk about that. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of what? Yeah. Look at the verse again, uh, verse 1. Up, make us gods who will go where? As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I'm wondering if it's only me who see problems with that phrase. Okay? That word gods, small g with an S, is simply the same Hebrew word Elohim, and it could be used in its plural or its singular sense. So let me deal with it in the singular sense. Here's what they're saying. Hey, Aaron, we've been waiting for God a long time. And, and the problem is, the person that God had set up between us and him, we need somebody or something who is going to take us to God because Moses is lost in the mountain. 
Now, the problem wasn't so much, well, let me not say it this way. The problem was not Moses' leadership. The problem was God was silent, and they wanted to create a vehicle that would force God to talk. Listen to the verse. I know this is new to some of y'all. We need somebody who is going to go before us. We need something that's going to lead us because it's been a long time since God spoke. And he's obviously quiet. So Moses must have gotten lost in the clouds somewhere. Something happened. So, and, and, and then here's the other mistake they make. Moses, the person who brought us out of Egypt. Do you see a problem? Moses didn't do nothing. Oh, come on, y'all with me. Mo, Mo, come on, y'all. That's why I had you read verse 19, chapter 19, where God says, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt on E. That's why, come on, are you with me? I am the Lord your God. That was a very, very important statement. So here's the mistake they made. They focused on the vehicle. Ah. And they, they missed a second time what God has done. So God, we need something we can look at so we can know you're there. Oh, come on, do I have any witnesses? We need something that we could see so we could know, God, that, that you're with us. We need to keep our eyes on something because right now there is nothing. So how do we know you're blessing? How do we know you're moving? How do we know you're speaking? How do we know you're doing what you're doing? How do we know you're God? Because there's nothing here. I wish I had somebody in here that can track with me. So, so here's what they said. Here's they said something happened to Moses, and it said so. Uh, so we don't know what become of him. So they said to Aaron, "Make us as for Moses, this man. We don't know what had become of him." So here's what Aaron said: Take off your gold, your rings that are in your ear, your wife, from your sons, your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears. They brought them to Aaron. He received the gold from their hands. And he fashioned it with a graven tool, and he made a what? Golden calf. And they said, watch this. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Chapter 19. Here's God. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt on eagle wings. Chapter 32, Moses goes up. Hey, Moses was the one who brought us out, and he's lost. So we need to replace Moses with, with, with something tangible that we can look at, that we can see, so we can say God is still moving in our midst because we can't see him no more. Are you guys with me? Come on, is this making sense? Are you with me? So they take off all their jewelry, they give it to Aaron, and Aaron carves this calf. And we go, that's why I can't do this in one week. And he presents it to them, and they look at the thing, and they say, yeah, that's the blessing of God. <laughs> let's read, let's read, let's read, let's read. It's in there, it's in, it's in there. Okay? Now, watch this real quick, because this is going to clarify some things for you really quick. Okay? And he received, verse 4, the calf from their hand, and fashioned it with a graven tool, and he made a what? Golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5 and 6 is troubling. When Aaron saw this. He built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to Hebrew Yahweh. This is troubling. Because for years, I thought they had built the golden calf 
to replace God. Right? And for years, I thought they were worshiping the golden calf and they stopped worshiping God. And I thought the problem with the text was that they had made a God out of the golden calf. You get what I'm saying? But then when I got to verse 6 and I saw after they finished this thing, Aaron said, here's what we're going to do. I'm a priest. I'm from the Aaronic lineage. I'm authorized to do some things. I'm going to build an altar and we're going to worship God through the calf. Or we're going to ask God to come down and bless the calf. So the calf can become the new Moses. So the calf can become the voice of God to us. So the calf can show us where God is. So the calf can continually keep us in the presence of God. I wonder, do you see that in the text? Are, are you with me? Are you with me? Because the problem, they, nowhere in the text do we see that they were replacing God with the calf. The problem and the tension in the text is the voice of God is missing. Moses has not come down yet, and they got tired of waiting. So they said, I'm going to create something, and in my creation of the thing, here's what we're going to do the next day. We are going to define to God, since he's in talking, how he needs to talk to us. Some crazy stuff. Now, here's what's striking, and we don't have time to deal with this. The whole time, they are conjuring up solutions to get God to talk. God is up in the mountain with Moses, telling Moses how he wants to bless the socks off of them. <laughs> how he wants to take, come on, y'all. He's defining all kinds of stuff with the tabernacles and the robes and the garments. He is talking about what true worship is and what worship is all about. And the whole time, listen to me carefully, because the vehicle was missing, they went and built their own. <sighs> Let's go to Exodus chapter 20, and then we're going to talk. Go to Exodus chapter 20. You guys are there? And I'm almost done. I just need to lay this foundation. You guys are there? Here's God. This is the Ten Commandments. You notice like the back of your hand. What I did know about this text that I learned doing uh, my exegetical work is that while God was saying this, those knuckleheads heard him. Yeah. Remember chapter 19? He came down and he called a business meeting. Remember that? And he said, Moses, come here. And he spoke loudly. And Moses interpreted and was striking. If you read the text for yourself, at some point, they were so afraid of God. They said, hey, God, why don't you, I mean, hey, Moses, why don't you just talk to us? Because whenever God speaks, man, it jacks us up. So why don't you just talk? It's in there. Read it. Now look at what he said to them while they had this business meeting together. Look at it. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who did what? Brought you out of the land of Egypt, house of the house of slavery. Chapter 2, verse 3. You shall have no other, what? Before who? The problem with the golden calf, they're still safe with verse 3. Most of y'all don't know that. They're still safe with verse 3. They're still safe with verse 3. Because the golden calf did not replace God. Are you with me? So they did not create another God before God. 
they replaced Moses, not God. Everybody okay? Come on, say, we with you, preacher. Just go ahead and say, I wish Hollywood knew this. <laughs> Are you with me? Okay? So they're okay with, with verse 2, with verse 3. The problem is verse 4. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth below or that is in the water beneath the earth. And look at verse 5. And you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a what? Jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a graven image um, or any likeness of it that is in heaven above or that is earth below, and you shall not, verse 5, bow down to them or worship or serve them because I am a what? Okay, cool. You've seen it twice. Go back to chapter 32. Let me say this and then I'm going to stop. Um, go to chapter 32 real quick and let's look at it again carefully. Then I'm going to stop. Give you a couple of applications and I'm going to stop. Verse 1, the middle. You guys are there? They gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, make us gods or get us a leader who will lead us. Moses has been gone. I'm paraphrasing, so we need to replace him. So Aaron took their stuff, and he fashioned something together, and he received the gold from their hand. And I'm in verse 4, and fashioned it with a graven tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 5, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, this is crazy. Look at this. Tomorrow shall be a feast of the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offering and brought peace offerings. And the people sat up and eat and drink and rose. Verse 5. When he saw this, he built an altar. And Aaron made a proclamation, a proclamation, a proclamation. And said, tomorrow we're going to invite God to come and be pleased with our calf. The problem is the calf. Moses was the mouthpiece of God to the people. I know I'm being repetitious. They don't know what happened to Moses. God said, wait. Moses said, if anything goes wrong, see Aaron and her, they mistakenly think something is wrong, and they create this calf, and then they worship the calf by inviting God to come down and lay hands on the calf, saying, this is the new Moses, that whenever you see the calf, you see me, or you know I'm with you. Can y'all put the, go back one slide, is that possible? Can you go back one? Right. Worship God for who he is, not because of what? Okay, go back one more if you can. Okay, whenever we worship anything as the vehicle through which we receive our blessings from God, and then we credit the thing with the move of God in our lives, I'm going to deal with this next week. We tempt God to abandon his plan for our lives, creating the need for mediation between God and ourselves. So, I'm done. Illustrations. God, I need a car so I can get to work. It's fair. God doesn't answer. So we go down to go Toyota or something. And we buy, I mean, we ain't got sense enough to go to Murray, but we go, to, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah just that. <laughs> if you're going to sin, sin, right? You know? <laughs> and we get this thing and we I'm using intentional word. We bring our calf to church. Here's a testimony. Look how God has blessed me. And then this is what we do. Lord, I thank you for the calf that you gave me. 
so I can get to work. God sits up in heaven. What in the... I know this is confusing, but I want you all to walk with me here, okay? Let me bring something closer to home, and don't nobody get mad with me. I'm just giving you illustrations. Your marriage is on the rocks, and he or she hadn't been home in a while. And God said, been quiet. And because he or she has become the vehicle of blessing, because as long as they come home, oh, Lord, I thank you for blessing. And we attribute the blessing to Moses as opposed to God himself. We worship and we serve the created thing more than the creator because the only time we give thanks to God is when the thing is in our presence. So God takes the thing up to the mountain and we pray in 40 days elapsed and then we go shopping. Girl, what should I do? And we call a meeting with Aaron. And Aaron says, take off your gold and Take off your rings and go to divorce court and go do whatever you got to do. Are you with me? And then we come back and, Lord, I thank you for releasing me. I thank you for freeing me up. Because we build a new calf and we invite God to come in to our calf. I know y'all don't like me right now, but, but I, gotta, I, want, I want us to get this because it's in the wait is where we mess God up. In the wait is where we mess ourselves up. In the wait is where we create these things, these graven images, these things that we could see because we don't have sense enough to worship God even though the thing is not there. We need to have a tangible image. We need to have a tangible person. We need to have a tangible something to bless God. Here's another one. You're sick, and the doctor says you're not going to make it. And, and you're waiting. No healing comes. And you're praying the whole time. And nothing happens. And then the person dies. And we go to the funeral. And we're saying, what's up, God? Because he didn't move on our behalf. And God wants us to learn this morning. I bless you because I'm God. Not because of who you are or what you want from me. It's all about what I said, what I want done, and who I am. The problem with a lot of us is that we've been so messed up with the prosperity teaching that we think we can call things into being as though they were not. We fool ourselves into thinking that we are God, that we can speak things into existence. You better look at that thing contextually and change your theology a little bit. We have fooled ourselves into thinking we can mandate God to come on our behalf, that we can mandate God to move if we say move. I'm sick, so God, you better heal me. I am commanding a healing. I am speaking a healing. Well, whenever you do that, you have just built a golden calf. And then you want to invite God, come in my calf. Whenever we set the rules, we play by our own rules. Whenever God set the rules, we have to play by, yeah, you get what I'm saying? When we play by our rules, look at the last verse. Don't look at it now. Read it when you get home. We have these orgies and these parties and all that stuff because we feel we can tell God what we want done. And if he doesn't move or speak or respond, when we say move, speak, or respond, we want to get upset with him so we create a calf. Uh, second thing I was going to tell you today, I'm done. If you want to take God off, build a calf. <laughs> I just want you all to hear me. You want to upset God, build, build a calf. Here's how Isaiah puts it. 
they that wait on the Lord shall what? Renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like what? Eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall do what? Walk and not faint. And he says, wait, I say, what? On the Lord. Church, if there's one thing I want you to get this morning, learn to wait on God because if we don't wait on God, I am guaranteeing you nine times out of ten, unbeknownst to yourself, you're going to create a golden calf. And then you're going to find your praise to God is not because of who he is, because of this thing that you built and you want to attribute it to the blessing of God. And so we end up worshiping the thing more than we worship God. Why am I saying that? Because the only prayer of thanksgiving we have for God is for what he did, not for who he is. So here's testimony. Praise the Lord, saints. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, sealing that with fire. Shonda. <laughs> Watch the next phrase. I want to thank the Lord for. You'll never hear nobody say, praise the Lord, saints. Saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to thank God because he took my husband. Hey! <laughs> you never hear that. It's always some calf or some image or something that has become the Moses in our life because the, when we look at the thing, we say, thank you. And we can't thank him when the thing isn't there. <laughs> this graven image thing is really jacking me up because I have to make sure in my personal life that my wife does not become my cow. That didn't sound right. <laughs> so, yeah, that didn't, yeah, that didn't, yeah, that did not sound right. Yeah, that did not, that did not sound right, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that didn't sound right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Baby, you know I love you, right? Yeah, yeah, it's all good, right? Uh, <laughs> wow, that did not sound right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> be careful, saints, be careful, be careful. Now, now, you're going to see uh, the reason I, I want, and you get to hear the whole thing, because in the other part, I'm not saying don't pray, don't pray, because the only reason God relented, and I'm using the word relent, not repent, but relent, is because Moses prayed. Prayer is important, but your prayer is not to move God. Your prayer is to accept, excuse the grammar term, but what's the never God want to do? Right? So, whenever we worship anything as the vehicle through which we receive the blessings from God, and then credit the thing with the move of God, that's where we mess up. I want to thank you for my new car. I want to thank you for my new home. I want to thank you for my new clothes. I want to thank you for my life. I want to thank you for my son. I want to thank you. Whenever we credit the thing, as opposed to saying, God, I just want to thank you because you're God. You're going to see this next week. This is very, very important. Because when God got ticked off, here's what he said to Moses. Moses, when you go down the mountain, you're going to find that your people. <laughs> I mean, they did say you brought them out, right? So your people. And a lot of times God looks at you and he looks at me and he says, oh, that must be um, Nation Star Mortgage's people because they seem to worship him more than they worship me. That must be public service credit unions people because they worship them more than they worship. Y'all see where this is going, right? That must be Comcast's per, or, or the cell phone Verizon's person because they worship them more than they worship me. I hope y'all see where this is going. The thing that has the most of you really is your... Uh. And we credit the thing. It's time to turn it around. Thou shalt have no other God before me, and you shall not bow down to them nor worship them. So we take off our rings and our earrings and our gold to make the graven image, and then we dumb enough, excuse the term, don't get offended, to invite God to come and worship the thing that we created. 
Time to burn some calves up, right? Time to burn some calves up. Bow your heads with me. Worship team, don't come. I'm good. Don't come. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Here's what I want to do. In your seat, just bow your head for a prayer of repentance. Now you know how my week has been. Lord, forgive me. And like the Israelites, if you're just as guilty, say, Lord, forgive you. And if you're here and you don't even have a relationship with God, say, Lord, come into my life and save me. So that God can be God.